One of the most important concepts for programming is the idea of different types of data. It allows us to assign meaning to what ultimately is just a bunch of zeros and ones. Computers don't have this concept built into their hardware, programmers merely expect it to exist when writing software. Data types could be considered a form of flow control, which is embedded into a program during compile time. All a machine really sees is that certain bytes are processed by certain functions. Only the corresponding source code reveals that those bytes are a string of characters, for example, that are being output to the console. Within the confines of my compiler, such a type system is represented by connections between nodes. In the last video, we covered the concept of port nodes and how they result in certain socket inputs. Today, we'll discuss another component of node construction, socket connectivity. A socket can be connected to if at least one so-called type node is connected to the corresponding port. If such a connection is formed, a so-called nodule is rendered for the corresponding socket. These nodules represent a potential endpoint for a connection that will hold data of a certain type. Within the user interface, they act as a button that is used to draw new connections. Whenever a nodule is clicked, the initialized connection can only be completed by clicking another nodule associated with the same type of data. Input sockets can allow multiple types of data, while output sockets only allow a single output type. My type system effectively boils down to matching the names of different types. A node expecting one of our previously implemented integer types, for example, will only allow connections to output sockets that provide that exact type of integer. This ensures that functions within our final programs will never receive data that does not follow the expected formatting. However, it also allows inputs of multiple types, which effectively emulates the concept of function overloading in a much broader sense. The type node is actually quite simple to explain. The first socket acts as a connection point to the output of a port node. This is where the external input data is received. The switch input below it is used to mark a type as the default for the corresponding socket. This default type will be used in case of direct input into the external input field. Since multiple type nodes can be associated with a single port, one of them has to be marked for use if the input type isn't known. After that, another switch allows users to toggle between a selection of built-in types or a text field for defining a custom data type. When set to the former, an additional switch is made available for disabling the creation of an external nodule. This is useful for enforcing unique parameters per node instance, since connections to that socket will be made impossible. Finally, an output socket at the bottom provides the actual input data that the port node received externally, now associated with the specified data type. The only socket type that doesn't allow input connections because it doesn't use type nodes is the selection type. Select sockets use option nodes instead, which, as the name suggests, define the options that are available externally. They connect to a port node just like type nodes do, and only provide a simple text input for the externally visible option label. When the corresponding selection input is constructed, these options are sorted alphabetically. For most simple node definitions, this is all one needs to know about types and options. However, there is much more complexity associated with these nodes under the hood. They play a vital role for so-called node graph activation, which allows a user to enable different parts of the same node network based on received input. So let's tackle this topic in the next video before diving back into our first executable.